It's good to worship together, wasn't it? Come on, let's praise God for our time. And uh, man, I'm, you know, some of you know I come in from Wheaton and just got done speaking there and caught that last song. Was that an awesome time of worship? Come on, let's praise God. And so thankful for our worship team that prepares us. Uh, I just met Titus uh, t- just moments ago, and he led us today, and uh, just one of the, Jessica's friends. And man, we got some good people here, don't we? Good people to lead us into the presence of the Lord. And I don't know about you, but when I hear the name Titus, that's a strong name, isn't it? And then I think of Ron. Yeah. <laughs> Titus Zappia. That's what I'm going for. Right there. Maybe a grandkid. I don't know. That's just a message for some of you watching at home. You know who you are. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk Chicago. Let's talk Sears Tower. Yeah, I said it. I ain't calling it by that other name. Anybody with me? I mean, you know, if you're a true Chicagoan, we don't, I don't even know what that other name is. Sears Tower, it did this. It was constructed in 1974. And what's interesting about it, it only took three years to build this skyscraper. 2,000 employees. It reaches 1,730 feet high. If you count everything, they say it's 110 stories high. It was the tallest building for 25 years in the entire world. For the last, for 41 years, it was the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. Today, catch this, it's still the tallest steel structure supported building. What does that mean? That means I ain't going on anything taller. Anybody with me? Do you know what that means? That means it's got more steel than anything of these other ones. And and literally, I'm no engineer, but engineers say that the amount of steel that is below the ground is a great degree to do what? To help with what's above the ground. And so any skyscraper, it does what? It needs to have a solid foundation. Said all that to simply say this, we need a solid foundation. Just like a skyscraper can't endure the elements and will fall down if it doesn't, if it's not structurally sound, the same is true for you and me. That's what I want to talk to you about. I want to welcome all those joining us online. We're so thankful that you're with us. Grab your Bibles here. Grab your Bibles at home. Open to Matthew chapter 7. Title of the message, Jesus asks the question, what am I building my life on? That's what this passage is all about. And what's interesting is Jesus in this passage, as we talk about recalibrating our reliance on him, he says that there's only two options. In our day with, you can go pick out color after color after color, size after size after size, style after style after style of anything from jeans to cars to houses. You're either building on the rock, you're building on the sand. Those are the only two options. It's just two. I mean, there's only two options that Jesus gives us. So let's listen to him as we recalibrate our reliance. That's what that series is about. If you're joining us again online, you haven't been with us for a while, or maybe you're here today as a visitor, we want to recalibrate to God and what he wants. That's what this series, it's red letter. It's all about Jesus' words. And so I've been challenging us, let's bring our Bibles, let's come ready, let's open up and hear from God. Jesus says in verse 24 of Matthew 7, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise person who built their house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been found on the, you tell me, the rock. It says in verse 26, and when everyone hears these words of mine does not do them, would be like a foolish person who built their house on the sand And look what happens here. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Father, I just ask you to bless our time together as we gather in this space and you'd clear our minds and that we'd hear from you and you alone. Father, as we do a personal inventory and be our own inspectors of what we're building on, would you help us by the end of this message, Lord, to, to make some choices that need to be made to, to make some changes if needed that, that Lord, we want to build on the rock. And Lord, help me to share the benefits of that from your word. 
Help me to share the advantages of that. Help me to share the blessings, Lord, as we do this together. If you agree with that prayer, simply say amen. First benefit, first blessing, first advantage to building on the rock. I've got a few of them. When I build my life on the rock, I set myself on a firm foundation. So it's solid and it's secure. This is what I, everybody up for a little fun? One person over here, the rest of you close your eyes. I'm just kidding. Anybody up for a little fun? Okay, it's church. We're having a little fun in balcony. Thanks for being here. I don't want this. This is what we don't want. You're not thinking this is fun. Is this more scary than fun? I don't even know where we got this picture. Look at that. It looks like it's from the 40s or something. She's in quicksand. I don't want that. We don't want this. I mean, look at that struggle. And we certainly don't want this. That's creepy. Let's get that off the screen. We want this. This is what we're going for. That's the picture. I'm not talking about balancing on something. I'm talking about a secure and solid foundation that rises us up over everything else. That's what Jesus is talking about. So the question we need to answer is how. And the how, if you've been to this passage before, it's quite simple. It's about hearing and doing. That's what it means to build on the rock. To build on the sand, all we need to do is look at verse 26. It's about hearing and not doing. That's what it means to build on the sand. I mean, you can't get more basic than that. Anybody can understand that. But let's take it one step further, and this is what the whole Christian life is about. I wish I could say it was something different. It's about obedience. I hear and do. It's about disobedience. I hear, but I do not do. That's the Christian life. You mean to tell me I came all the way here to church for you to tell me that? Yes, I'm sorry. It's about obedience or disobedience. To what? To who? Well, this is where we got to put our thinking caps on. And Jesus tells a story. Remember who's telling the story? Jesus is the living word. He's the word that came down and took on flesh, it says in John chapter 1. So I don't think it's a big jump to say what Jesus is talking about is is the truth of his word. And so for us today, what is the truth of his word? The rock is the timeless truths of the book that I'm holding in my hand. That's the rock. Let's just get real simple. What's the sand? Well, the sand is the shifting philosophy of the world. And so we've got timeless truth versus the culture and the shifting sand that we're in. Everybody understand? That, that's what he's saying. So he's asking, what are you building on? Are you building on the rock? And I've come to know that this book has been what? It's sufficient. This book is reliable. This work is, book is trustworthy. This book, theologians tell us, is inerrant. That means in its original inerrant, in its original manuscripts, there's no error. This book, and I won't bore you with the details, I've said this before, but over 1,500 years it took to write this book from 40 different authors, from all walks of life, from shepherds to kings. It was written on three continents. The, the words of God are here. This book is like a roadmap for your life. This book is, it's almost like a mirror to your soul. That's what it is. So that's the book that we're talking about. Let's not make the book be something that it's not. This is not a science book or a math book. It's not a history book, although it contains a lot of history. No, the book itself says that what it's for is this book is for life and godliness. So that's what it claims to be. Let's not make it something it's not. It's everything it says that we need for life and godliness. That's the truth that's proclaimed in God's word. Well, can I have doubts? I mean, what if I'm not there yet? Am I welcome? Yes, you are. Of course you are. Well, what, what if I'm not sure? Again, doubt is a place where we all have doubts. It's just, I would just suggest you wouldn't make it a residence. You would make it a short stay that you wouldn't take up residence in your doubt. But I remember reading in Billy Graham's autobiography entitled Just As I Am. And he tells the story of when he had doubts. And he was literally, he was in Southern California. And this is before all the big 
notoriety, and he's in Southern California at this place called Forest Home Camp. And he's getting ready, it's Youth for Christ, and he's teaching to a group of people. And then there was a pastor, this guy named Chuck Templeton, and he came up to me and said, well, how do you know for sure? This is a pastor. How do you know if this is God's word? And, and how do you know if it's, I mean, don't you ever question that? And this guy got into Billy's head. And interestingly, Billy, he got into his head so much that he, he was such a man of conviction that he's like, I, I don't know if I can go on tonight if I don't settle this. And he couldn't answer Chuck's questions. Now, interestingly, Chuck went on to be he left the faith and became an atheist. You know, this whole idea that deconstructing the faith is new, this has been going on for a long time. I mean, he deconstructed to atheism. And then what happened to him? He became a radio, famous radio broadcaster in Canada. That's what happens to all atheists. <laughs> Just kidding. But then you know what he said years later? He wound up saying, which I thought was remarkable, he wound up saying that even though he was an atheist, he said, I miss Jesus. Think about that for a moment. He, he experienced something and he missed it. But back to the story, Billy Graham went on a walk, a prayer walk. And what's interesting about this is he just, he set the Bible down on this tree stump or this rock was right there. And, and he, just, he just got before God and he just started praying, Lord, I, I can't answer all of Chuck's questions. And, and I'm just asking, I'm asking you to reveal yourself to me. And Lord, I, despite the fact that I don't have every question answers, I'm putting my trust and my confidence in your written word. And by faith, I believe this book to be true. And he was going to describe a sense of God's presence and his filling. And, and then what he went on to do, and he went on to teach that night, and hundreds of kids came to know Christ. The year was 1949, and then what he went on to do was he went on to do the L.A. crusade, which thousands of people came to know Christ. And so he needed to have that moment, and I think we have a couple pictures even of this is the place he's preached there before. This is the rock, and there's actually a plaque on it that this is the place where he just, he just said, man, I... I I need a place where I just settle this in my heart right now that by faith I embrace your word as truth even though I have questions, even though I'm unsure. And I gotta tell you that I have a place like that where I could tell you a story of how I was having some doubt and I put the stake in the ground. And, and so if you haven't done that, I mean, I'm just encouraging you, that's a step to take. I believe this book is reliable, it's sufficient. It contains everything I need for life and godliness. It's the solid footing that I'm standing on for myself, for my family, for our church. Can I get an amen? That that's the buck. It's the solid truth of God's word. And so what's the next benefit or we're calling it advantage, or what's the blessing? Well, when I build my life on the rock, I'm enabled. I'm not able in and of myself. I'm enabled to withstand the storms of life, meaning I, I couldn't do it without this. And so the great Galveston hurricane that hit Galveston, Texas back in 1900, why are we still talking about it? Because it's known as the greatest hurricane or the most devastating and dangerous. We've got pictures of it. It just was incredible the damage that it, that it made. And literally, if you added up all the hurricanes since, it hasn't equaled the number of lives that it took. It took over 14,000 people. And so the storm literally lasted for three weeks. Think about that for a moment. I don't know about last night, where I live, it was like it was coming down. It was like raining, like it was coming down. And we were supposed to do a little barbecue and a little uh, chicken on the grill. And, and so we bought the chicken, and we had it all going. And so I went upstairs and said, Jody, I'll endure the rain for the family. And so I went upstairs to change into some galoshes. And, well, not that, but putting on something. And next thing I knew, I came down, and guess who was grilling? She was. She had the umbrella. And so I'm so thankful for a nice wife, aren't you guys, too, that I'm just... And so I didn't do anything now that I think about it. I just watched her and... I enjoyed the meal, and this is way off topic. But she withstood the storm for the family. 
But could you imagine? I mean, it's silly to think that, but if that storm that hit us last, it just kept going and going for three weeks. I mean, I mean, that's what we see here. And so let's put the picture of this guy, Isaac Klein. He was the meteorologist, and there's actually a book uh, that is, he wrote, or that's been written about him, and it's called Isaac Storm. And in this book, he describes and he talks about the fact that he was a meteorologist who predicted the storm. Can you believe that? And so he's like, this is coming, guys. We've got to get ready. Let's go. And nobody listened to him. They didn't listen to him at the station. His family didn't listen to him. And so when it hit, he wound up leaving and he went home only to find that it had hit his house, his neighborhood. He had a wife and a daughter and three girls and they were just scattered all over, literally drowning. And so fortunately, they were able to rescue his three daughters, but he lost his wife and his baby that day through the devastation of this storm. And so I, I'm not saying that I'm going to warn you and be the spiritual meteorologist that says the storm's coming, but, but I've been around long enough to know that there's either one of three things that are happening. You're either what? You're either in a storm right now, and maybe you are. You've either just come out of a storm, thank the Lord, or number three, you're probably entering into a storm. Because let's look at the text. It doesn't say this. It doesn't say the rain might have fall. It doesn't say the floods could come. It doesn't say the winds, yeah, they kind of blew. They might have. It doesn't say that it might have beat on that house. No, it says the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and they beat on that house. And so we, we will endure storms. And so how are we enabled to endure? That's what Jesus is talking about. If we build on the rock. And so what kind of storms? Well, let me just give you a list. I, we go pretty quick here. These are the top storms that I've seen that over the last 20 years in ministry. Physical storms. And this is because we live in a fallen world. This is the earthquakes. This is what we just saw, the devastation of a hurricane and all these physical storms. This could be you breaking your ankle, going to the emergency room, or getting the call and you found the lump and next thing you know, it's cancer. I mean, these are physical storms as a result of the fallen world that we live in. Then there's what? There's relational storms. And these can hit 9.5 on the Richter scale. How come? Well, I'm having an issue with my family. My sister, my brother, my uncle. Why is it that we're having these relational storms? Well, people in our families, they're not perfect. So that's why we have issues. You say, I have an issue at work. Well, people at your workplace, the employees, they're not perfect. I've got an issue at my school. Well, people at your school, the instructor or the student, they're not perfect. Hey, I've got an issue at our church. Well, church members are for sure not perfect. Some pastors are. <laughs> Craig, I'm kidding. But we're not perfect. I mean, fill in the blank. I mean, we have relational strife and problems and difficulties because we're not perfect. And the last guy that was perfect that walked the face of the earth, what did we do to him? Got rid of him. Put him on a cross. I mean, we're all going to go through physical, relational. What else? We're going to go through emotional storms. This is the grief, the anger, the confusion, the depression. I mean, we're all going to hit emotional storms. Number four, spiritual storms. This is why I love this book. I mean, what I love about this book, it just doesn't hide anything. It doesn't paint everything like everything's going to be great. And No, it talks about the good, the bad, the ugly of life and, and how we can withstand it. And, I mean, so the Old Testament talks about the wilderness period. I wonder how many people in this section only would be honest. Have you been through a wilderness period? I can raise my hand and say I have. Man, I didn't feel God. I didn't hear him. I, I didn't know what, I just didn't sense his presence. That's talked about in the Old Testament. And how about this? And we get to the New Testament and, and the persecution of the church. That the church was persecuted. Why? Because of what they believed. I mean, are we not there yet? I mean, can you imagine like the, the shifting sand of the culture? I, I, I don't know. I, if I couldn't have predicted 
10 years ago, what changes are here now? Do you know what I mean by that? I mean, from the gender identity to these and all these issues that we're facing, that, that culture is moving in a direction. You believe what? I mean, my parents, I mean, God help them, they'd be rolling in their grave. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I'm just saying we, we couldn't have predicted 10 years ago where we're at today. Can you imagine where we're going to be? And so you got to just make a choice. Like I'm either going here or I'm just going to, I'm going to just, you know, kind of be in the river of this world and just flow wherever it takes me. Like, I don't know about you, man, but I remember in my own life and I've done this message now four times. I I haven't said this. I, I remember in my own life, like, I, it sounds so stupid, but like when I was a kid and even into college, like I, if there was a book that I could read that had all the principles that I could stand on, like I didn't even know that it was the Bible. Like I put my trust in this book. It's my secure foundation because it reveals the God who I love. And, and so there's spiritual storms that we need to endure. There's financial storms. Now, I'm just going to go on record, and I'm going to confess, I like big SUVs. Anybody with me? Maybe not in this service. This is the green service. (laughs) I'm not apologizing for the fact that I'm six foot five and three quarter, and the weight's going up. I wish it wasn't. And I like driving a big car, man. I don't like small cars, and so I was at the gas station the other night, and as I was filling up my big SUV, and it stopped at $100, not because the tank was full, because that's all they would let me put in. I'm like, I got like at least another quarter of a tank. I thought for the first time, could I squeeze this body into a smaller car? (laughs) I mean, we're all going through financial struggles. And so I'm joking about the inflation and the gas prices and I mean, but we've got people at our church, they've gone through financial storms to the degree where, man, they've lost everything. They got sued and just made it through. I mean, I mean, these the storm's coming. And and lastly, I mean, this is like the end cap. This is the common denominator of all storms. I remember when I was in college and my roommates in college, we used to joke around. I didn't even know Christ. And we were just, we'd talk about, you know what? This is you to our roommate. This is the world. This is us. And everything revolves around you, man. That's just how it works around here. Like you want everything to, and isn't that true of us? That we want everything to revolve around us. That's pride. And I've heard it said that what? That at the root of the tree of sin, it's pride. No matter what fruit that it bears of sin, it's always pride. And and that's James chapter four. That's the summation of number six. So isn't it interesting in this story that when we think about the storm, if we were just looking at these two houses on a good sunny day, that they would look very similar. And if you were in looking to buy a house, you'd probably say, yeah, I could buy either one. But it wasn't until the storm came that you're like, man, I, I want this one for sure because this is the one that's solid. Like God's word is what gets us through the difficulties that we face, that we can put our faith and our trust in it and believe in the God that it reveals. And so next, benefit or advantage or blessing. Good stuff today? When I build my life on the rock, I'm empowered to reach new heights. So let's stick with the terminology or the example for a moment. I'm talking about increasing the square footage of your character. I'm talking about putting a new, I don't know, floor on or a new addition to the maturity that you have. That's what we're speaking about. And so now I want to just draw the attention to Jesus uses the rock, he uses the sand, Jesus uses the wise, Jesus uses the foolish. So what's the wise and the foolish piece? Well, I think we get it. Wisdom, hearing and doing. Foolishness is hearing and not doing, or we could add not hearing and not doing. But what's the relationship? Well, 
grant me a little bit of leeway here if we talk about wisdom for a moment. We want wisdom because that's what puts us on the solid foundation. That's the maturity builder. Well, well, what's with the wisdom? Well, I would suggest that wisdom and knowledge are not the same. They're different. Again, give me a little leeway. Knowledge says that I know that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom says that I'm not going to put a tomato in the fruit salad. Now, do you know what I mean? Oh, that's very helpful advice. Thank you. If that's the only thing you got out of the message, I'm a bit concerned. But seriously, there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. We have a lot of knowledge right now. Would you agree with me for a moment that we've got more knowledge, facts, and figures, and it's just coming at us? And I remember as I pick up my phone, like when I went to college, we didn't have phones. We didn't, it, um, we didn't even have the internet. We didn't have electricity when I was in college. <laughs> I'm joking. Some of you, I'm looking at the crowd. You're not. I'm, you remember that. I'm just kidding. So, but at Bowling Green State University, they were ahead of their time. I got to be honest. There's another guy in here that went to Bowling Green State University. And um, I met, <laughs> he comes to our church. And when I went there, what was funny, they had this thing called fact line. So you could pick up your rotary phone and, and you could call 24 hours. And what they would do is they would answer any question that you had. So me and my roommates, we'd just call them. And we just ask the stupidest questions. And about sports and about history, like we're just trying to stump them. I mean, we, you couldn't go to, a, you know, you had to go to a library to find all this. And, and so I've always pictured like what was going on at the fact line and you, you had a room full of nerds. Are you hearing me? Sorry. This is before being a nerd was cool. And they, they just got all these books and like, you know, wh what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, let me just tell you about the wisdom of that analogy and where it came from. I was just like, whoa, dog, hold on, I was kidding. I mean, it was just funny that they had so, so much knowledge. And so that's actually where the internet was born, was Bowling Green State University. <laughs> but wisdom and knowledge are not the same. I can know a lot of things and a lot of facts, but wisdom is the application of that knowledge that results in life and godliness for those who are followers of Christ, that, that I'm different as a result of the wisdom that I have. And, and so we're going to do this study, and um, Pastor Craig and I, we're really excited, along with the rest of our location pastors, we're reading through Proverbs, because Proverbs is all about wisdom. And so in June, yeah, June and July, we're going to do a series in the summer on wisdom from the Proverbs. Sound like a good idea? Everybody up for that? Good stuff. Do a little voting in church. That's good. And so by this round of applause, we'll do it. Um, balcony, we okay? We'll do a different message series for you. Yeah, right. And, um, but, but I'm just saying, we're, we're going to do this study because we want to seek wisdom, which is the application in our context of biblical truth. Jody and I had a great um, week. We, we had the privilege of being with several pastors and their wives um, in Charleston, South Carolina. And every year we get invited uh, with some other pastors of some pretty good-sized churches. It's really a humbling thing. And, and they, um, we get to this thing, and they always bring it. It's always two weeks after Easter. And then they bring in like just people that you wouldn't necessarily hear from. So they brought in, so we did a pastor, uh, we did a gathering. You know, there's like 80 of us in the room. And they did a, uh, John Maxwell came in, and he, he taught us. And he's the leadership guy, the leadership guru, and it was really interesting. And then, and then I, got, I got to tell you this, I, I didn't really know much about, I had heard about him, but I didn't know the next guy. They brought in this 86-year-old guy. His name's R.T. Kendall. And if you're not familiar with him, I wasn't. He's, he's written over 80 books. And, and what's, what's interesting about him is he grew up in Kentucky, and, and then what, he came to Baptist Church, grew up in Kentucky, and then he wound up doing his higher education at Oxford. He wound up staying there in England. And then he's famous for this, for following in the footsteps of Martin Lloyd-Jones. So again, this is Christian history and pastor talk. Martin Lloyd-Jones was the pastor at the revered, I mean, Westminster Chapel and he's like the authority on preaching. Like you read his books and you read his sermons and like this is like this guy next to Spurgeon, it was like, then it's him. And, and so this guy, R.T. Kendall, he followed in his footsteps at the church. 
And he just, I mean, this 86-year-old guy, he's up there and he's just sharing how difficult that was to be in somebody's shadow, how ministry is hard. And he, he wrote this book. I, I, I'll give you the title, please. I'm, I'm going to tell all our staff, we're going to have a staff meeting on Tuesday. We're going to buy it for all of our staff that, that there's a book he wrote called Total Forgiveness. It's unbelievable. I mean, and, and he, he makes the argument, he talks about the fact that, that we hold on to things and it actually hurts our blessing that God wants to give. And so we grasp and we want to get even and even when we say we've forgiven, we haven't. And, 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 and so he was, he was dropping like so much wisdom. I, I haven't been in a session like that for years where I was just like, I mean, Jody and I, I'm holding her hand, we're in tears, man. This guy was unbelievable. And then he said this, and I was so fortunate to be there. He said, the deeper the hurt, the greater the suffering, the deeper the anointing. And what he means by that is the anointing is the giftedness that God has given to you and how he uses you in your circle of influence. And he just said, man, you've been hurt. He goes, you're going through suffering? He embraced that, forgive, do what God needs to do. And I mean, he's going to bless that. We go through pain and we go through suffering and we endure the storms. We're enabled to endure the storms so that we can help others endure the storms. So that we can be an encouragement. That's the church. That's the picture of what we're to do. And that leads to the last benefit, the last advantage, the last blessing is that when I build my life on the rock, I'm equipped to help others set their spiritual footings, their foundations. God wants to use me to do that. And yeah, you know, I don't have that much knowledge. I don't have that much wisdom, but God has equipped you. He's anointed you to be a help to others. That's the point. And so back to the story, I, I just want to make sure that no one has to go through this, that I don't want there to be these four words in your life. I don't want you to have to experience great was the fall. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I don't want any board in our church that great was the fall. Like, I don't want you to have great was the fall in your marriage. I don't want to have great was the fall in your family. I don't want you to have great was the fall in your business. I don't want to see that. And I know I'm not guaranteeing that the storm isn't going to come. But we can lessen the pain that it doesn't have to get devastated that that's what a life looks like that's built on the rock, that we recalibrate our reliance upon him and his word. Come on, that's what we're going for. Are you with me? Let's recalibrate our desires to him. See, some of us, what we're doing is we're building a little addition and we're on the rock in this area, but we've built an addition with this relationship We've built an addition over here with this job search. We've built an addition over here with whatever that it's not passing the smell test of God's word. It's actually, we didn't seek him. It could even be disobeying him. And so we want to recalibrate to the foundation of his word. I remember when uh, Joe and I, we, when we moved to Wheaton, so we were living in Arlington Heights, and we were gonna plant the church, and so the, the conviction was we wanna have a house in the area that we're planted. We started at Glenbard South, this is year 2000, so this would have been like 1999. We're looking for a house in Wheaton. And you say, why Wheaton? Well, Joe Stoll, who not the Joe Stoll, it's son, who's a good friend of mine and had a chance to get to know him pretty well, and, and uh, he was like, I was like, I'm, I don't really wanna to move to Wheaton because that's where all the Christians are. I was afraid of them. And he goes, we'll move to South Wheaton. That's where all the pagans live. <laughs> and he goes, I'll show you this neighborhood. It's called Arrowhead. And that's where the pagans are. You're going to fit in right, right there. <laughs> and so we moved in. Sorry if you're from Arrowhead or watching from Arrowhead right now. That, well, that says a lot of what you're building on. <laughs> but we moved into this house. And I kid you not, we left this. I'm standing over here because Jody's over here. We left this please forgive me, we left this Georgian. It was a two-story. You know what a Georgian is? I mean, it's like quaint, it's cute, it's petite, it's nice. I mean, it was perfect. It, you know, the brick front and you know, one-car garage. It wasn't a big house, but it was, a, it was like everything was perfect. My mom was an antique dealer. She gave us antiques, and, and there was floral out the wazoo. Are you hearing me? It was just like everything's floral, and, but it was beautiful. 
And then we stepped here into this house and we recognized that there were some things we knew that were wrong with it. This is way before the television shows to teach you what to do. And literally, Ellie, our daughter, our oldest daughter's bedroom, I could take a quarter and put it on the ground and it would roll to the other side. It was literally, I mean, it was just the house was off balance. And then, I don't know, this one you know, day, I'm like, hey, Jode, what are the kids doing? And she says, well, they're swimming in the basement. <laughs> what does that mean? There was, <laughs> there was rain, and I kid you not, once we pulled down the, um, the drywall in the basement, like literally two and a half inch cracks everywhere, and when it, f- it, it rained, it, it just flooded it. And then the mice. Let's not get into that story for the health of my marriage. But the mice. And so the church, I, I kid you not, man, they band together. So they're like, we're going to get this right, man. And people, friends, contractors, and others, and, 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 and they, they fixed the foundation. They leveled it up the best that we could. Like, 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 is every, like the, we spent 19 years in that house. We loved it. I mean, that's the house that we raised our kids. Like, I got so many memories. Like, when I'm here at the office sometimes in Naperville and I'm driving home and, and, and I get on the phone and I don't know if this ever happened to you, but I get a little distracted. Next thing you know, I'm sitting in the driveway of the house that I don't own. Like, what the heck am I doing here? And then it's like, I love this place. <laughs> and, but I have so many memories of, of life in that house. And, and that's the picture of the church that we're just to help come alongside each other and to help each other to, to what? Set the spiritual foundations and patch the cracks, so to speak, and make sure the basement doesn't leak anymore. I mean, like some others have done some things and been through some things. That's the picture of biblical community. That's why immediately after this service, we're doing what we call um, a high point partner. And it's, it's actually kind of, I call it a blue plate special, but it's, it's what is it called? Fast Track. I can't ever remember this. So Fast Track is an opportunity for you to become a High Point partner. And let me just be candid. You know what? Partnership is pretty much down at an all-time down in churches everywhere, not just ours. This is, I'm going to stick my stake in the ground here because I know that I can't do it myself and that I want to help other people set their spiritual foundations. I need some help in setting my spiritual foundation. Man, I just want to build on the rock together. Amen? Amen. 30 minutes, right after service, don't have to sign up. Second floor, Craig will be up there. Jody and I will come visit. Like, like, like you could become a high point partner where let's do it together. So here's the benefits of building on the rock. I feel like I didn't do a great job, to be honest with you, because the advantages, I'm not trying to sell you something, but I'm just telling you, man, there's nothing better than this. There's, there's nothing more secure. There's nothing that brings me more confidence There's nothing that helps me with the pain that life brings. There's nothing that has helped me with the storms that I face. There's nothing I know that whatever storm comes up that God will see me through it, through his word. That's what he uses. Let's not neglect it. so, So this is what building on his timeless truth looks like. But I'll go back to how I started and I'm gonna ask for a response. Jesus said there's two different kinds of builders. Let's sum this up in a sentence. And they built on two very different outcomes. And, and they, they had two different foundations. I mean, that's the story in a nutshell. That's the bullseye. So the question is, what are you building on? And so in a moment, we're going to have some time to worship and we're going to sing. But I'm going to ask you to respond. In a moment, I'm just going to ask you some of you to stand. And so with heads bowed, and I'll ask you in a moment in about 60 seconds. And I'm just going to say, you know what? Just be honest between you and the Lord. And that if you have been building on the sand, that in a moment, it's going to be about 50 seconds from now. I'm going to just ask you to stand up. And I'm just going to ask, I'm going to pray for you. Maybe this is your moment. I talked about Billy Graham's. I had mine that, you know what? It was in that church on that day that it settled my fears that I'm building on the rock, man. I'm not, I'm not building on anything else. I don't understand all the things that the rock says. I don't know what, but I'm going to put my confidence and trust, and by faith, I'm going to trust God and his word. And then maybe there's 
There's another group, and again, in about 40 seconds, I'm going to ask the second group to stand. And, and maybe you're saying, I built on the rock. Like, I've, I've been building on this rock, man, for a long time. But maybe you're, like what I said, you just added little square footage. You've got this little thing going on on the side, man, and that thing's on sand. And I don't know if that thing needs to be torn down. But, but you've got to just make the decision that I need to do some renovation and I need to give this to the Lord and make sure that I'm building exclusively with all my decisions and with my future and with my relationships that I'm going to give that to you, Lord. And I'm going to ask you to stand in about 20 seconds. And then the last group, and I do it in five seconds, I'm going to ask you to stand. And those are the people that, you know what, I'm just going to say, could you make a decision today to say, I want to help somebody else. And I'm trusting the Lord, maybe even right now, if he would use this message to put somebody on your heart, whether it's a family member or a friend or your kid, you're just like, man, my son, he, I just, I need to help him set the spiritual footing. I, I got a neighbor and man, I, I could just, God, would you give me, grant me the privilege of being able to speak some truth and, and I'm going to ask you to stand. So with your heads bowed, if you've been building on the sand and you want to choose to build on the rock, I'm just going to ask you to, with boldness to stand up. Please just do it. I'm just head bowed, eyed closed that, that you would stand to your feet. And I thank you for standing, that I'm done with this. I, I'm going to put my trust in God's word. I'll give another moment. Thank you. Don't let this, I, I'm going to, I'm making a decision today. I don't have all the answers, God. I just, I just want to trust your word. Jesus said the truth will set me free and I need some freedom today. So thankful for those. And then the second group, you know who you are. Like, let's get with it. Just stand, man. You've been building and you, you built on the rock, but this little decision or this little, little sidestep or this little addition you got going on right now, just stand to your feet. So many, man, I need to just, I need to just give this to you, Lord. And, and maybe you got to take the wrecking ball to it. And maybe, maybe there's a way to save this. And maybe I, it's a little minor renovation, whatever it is. I see people standing in the balcony. And then lastly, I, if, if, you, if, you, if God's laying somebody on your heart that you want to help, would you just stand? That you want to help set their spiritual footings. You want to help set them in the right direction because you've paid some stupid tax, I like to say, and you want to help them to build on the rock. Let's all stand together. Father in heaven, I ask that you would take the sincerity of our heart and that we confess to you that we cannot do this on our own, that we believe in the truth of your word. We believe in your son who came to fulfill it. We believe in your son who spoke it. And he said that we are to build our life on the rock and that God, if we choose to do that, that we won't endure the pain. We will stand and withstand and we recommit ourselves to you. The timeless truth of your word, would you help us, Lord, to abandon the things that are not worth building on and to build on what you're gonna bless? And so whether that's a choice or a decision that needs to be made today, I pray for your grace that your people would do it. And for those of us who want to help other people, Lord, I pray that you would give us favor and blessing. Because, Lord, we know that the rock doesn't move. And we need some stability and security and I just pray your blessing on each person in this service, those that are making decisions for you, that the rock won't move. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we proclaim with loud voices now that our heart's desire is to build upon your truth. If you agree with that prayer, simply say amen. Let's worship together.